they're amazing little creatures. They're, this might be bad of me to say, but anytime you can get this many women to get along in one spot without killing each other, it's amazing. It's been a lot of fun. I've gotten a lot of enjoyment out of it. But originally, my brother's children, which is my niece and nephew, they had allergies pretty bad. And like most people, you don't, you get tired of, oh, you got the sniffles, let's take a pill. Oh, you got a cold, let's take a pill. He wanted to try to do a little bit more natural means of, of keeping his kids healthy. I was 14 years old. My uncle told me to learn as much as you can about as many things as you can, because the more you know, the easier it is to keep people out of your pocketbook. And I always liked doing stuff out in the woods anyway, so I thought, well, shoot, I'll, I'll see what beekeeping's about. I was in, in the Marine Corps in, in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. I went in a store and they had a book on honeybees and I picked it up and looked at it and bought it. And I guess that sort of sparked my interest also because I'd, I'd never known a beekeeper before. So I went in it totally, totally green with no mentor to back me up. I didn't get a, my first beehive until 1976. One of the more rewarding things for me is relaxing just to come out here and watch them flying in and out. A lot of times I'll come out here and just sit down. But that's me. I, everybody don't like that, I don't guess, but I do. My neighbor's got gardens. They plant garden over there and a garden over here. And the next neighbor, he's got a garden down there that helps them get vegetables. And the neighbors, when they get plenty, they bring me some. <laughs> Colony collapse disorder happens for many different reasons. There's not one select reason why for colony collapse. Basically, they can do anything from just starvation to disease to pesticides. Um, so there's always something new seems like it's come around every couple of years that the European honeybee happens to be acceptable to that can very quickly kill out an entire hive. You got the varroas, varroa mites, you got trachea mites, which are almost gone now, but you got the hive beetles. You got, there's some kind of big hornet looking thing that, that flies around sometimes out front, snatching the bees in midair and takes them off and eats them. That, in all the times I've been keeping bees, that's the first one I've had. You don't know when it's gonna happen, where it's gonna happen, whether it's gonna take out one hive or 20. I think ultimately it's going to come down and be discovered the production of hybrid vegetables are going to have a big impact on it. Because you know they're, they're, they've got corn nowadays you can plant and spray it with Roundup and the corn will not die. It's called Roundup Ready Corn. You plant the seeds and sprouts and Roundup will not kill the corn and kill the grass all around it, but not the corn you got all the hybrid vegetables coming in. But even the NC State beekeepers at NC State, the ones that are in charge of the entomology departments across North Carolina, they don't know what causes the colony, 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 bee colony to collapse. You can use chemicals. But like with anything, that's probably the chemicals are one of the reasons why everything's about in the shape it is now is because too much chemicals and not enough natural selection. Because basically anything that you baby and just don't let take care of itself a little bit, it just, it can't develop any natural defenses to anything. I mean, I can see the point of helping out a little bit with traps or something like that but to the point of where the bee actually doesn't do anything for itself. And that's how we get into trouble. If you got one strong hive, you can actually take a whole frame of brood, which is baby bees that are still capped, and you can take that entire frame of bees, which is about 1,500 bees, and you can actually put them into a weak hive. So, Cause last year I lost three hives for the simple reason 
because it rained too much. Basically, the rain washes away the nectar and the pollen. If it washes away the nectar and the pollen, the bees can't do their job. They just can't go out and pick it up off the ground. There ain't no 10 second rule in nature. Typically, I don't do anything to protect them from anything other than snow getting in front, blocking the entrance. Because if the temperature gets above 47 degrees, they're gonna start flying. And this one I may probably have to either take honeycomb from here to put in it or feed them sugar water. And there's times when a colony is weak and I'll, I'll still brood from a strong hive to put in a weaker one. And that helps relieve some of the congestion in the hive. I look at it, there's only so much you can do because bees are similar to people. You can tell them stuff, you can show them stuff, you can do things for them, but if they don't like it, they're gonna do their own thing anyway. <laughs> so your hands are kind of tied because they're wanting to live life their way. Bunch of them got pollen. The hive beetles, best I can recall, we started seeing them somewhere around 1997. These little insects, they're called hive beetles. Hive beetles are nasty little creatures. I said, usually you can tell how strong a hive is by how many of these things are in there. By obvious, there's a bunch in this one. So either the bees have been crawling them over on this one hive, this one frame right here, or the hive itself is not very healthy. So what hive beetles do, basically, when they go through, they're eating the wax, they're eating the honey, they're just being a general nuisance. But the thing about it is, as they go through the hive and everything, they defecate. Which, when they defecate, it just completely contaminates the cell, the hive, everything. The bees, they will actually clean it out, clean it up, throw all the dead away. So the bees are very efficient, and it's surprising that there's this, this many in this hive. The European honeybee, their little pinchers on the front of their head, they're so small that they can't kill the beetle. So basically they can corral them, you know, keep them in just one portion of the hive. So that way it kind of keeps them away from everything else. Basically that's what people have been trying to do is breed Russian bees in with the uh, the European honeybee, so that way we can get a stronger bee because the Russian bees have bigger pinchers and such on the front of their head and are capable of defending off attacks and, you know, just killing off pests better. But the downside, the reason why a lot of people don't like messing with them is because they are a bit mean. The hive beetle running around, the queen looking for place to drop an egg, she won't go in an egg that's, or in a cell that's got a hive beetle in it. Mm -hmm. And the hive beetle lays one, they eat the pollen that's in the cell and lay their eggs and their eggs turn into a larva like a caterpillar or like a wax worm that, that eats around, wiggles around and that prevents the queen from laying eggs in that cell also. So when you get a strong hive beetle count 
station. The queen don't lay as much. Oh, so All like this, off. and the wax worms got in. That's a wax worm right there. Well, when the wax worms get in, they do this to it. Wax moths. When they make their cocoons, they, they're, they're like a butterfly. They'll spin a cocoon, and it'll they'll actually chew into the wood to make their make their cocoon, cocoon with. It surprises me because this hive was so strong three weeks before. They've, they've actually got four wings. When the varroa gets in them, one of the underwings sticks straight out. There's one. See how it sticks out like a butterfly on this side over here. That's a sign of, of the varroa mite getting in them. In, in the spring, it's a whole lot easier because you can do it naturally. By naturally, meaning you can take a frame that's predominantly bro uh, drone brood, the varroas go to the bigger brood, therefore they'll go to where the drones are. The drones take 27 days to hatch. Therefore, when the when, uh, when varroa gets in there, they stay in with the larva, even though it's capped over until it hatches. So you can take a frame of drone brood, pull it out, throw it in the freezer, and it kills the varroa mites in, in, the, in the sealed cells with, with the drones. Used to be a strong trachea mite infestation in the, in the area, but over the years the trachea mites have sort of disseminated and moved to heaven, I guess. <laughs> trachea mite, we started seeing it somewhere in the early 90s, like 91, 92. What the trachea mite does, it goes in the breathing tubes, which is on top of these heads, eats in the you can see tissue of the, of the trachea makes it swell up, and when it swells up, it actually chokes the, the bees. The word these are so gentle, to me, it, it's, it's amazing. Because you, you can pick them up and, and and they don't, to me, that's astounding. To me, that's one of the most amazing parts of beekeeping, seeing the bees when they first hatch out. 